Over the last several years, Jordan Peterson has been wrestling with the Bible. He's been wrestling with God, always able to communicate effectively what the Bible shares, but never fully revealing if he actually believes or has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, we might get some insights into what Jordan Peterson actually believes based on what he said. So let's dive into it. Let's discover what does Jordan Peterson believe. Before we begin, my name is Don, and this podcast exists to encourage, inspire, and educate you not only in the Bible and the Word of God, but also how to live as Christians in a postmodern, relativistic, post-Christian world. So, let's get into it. Last week, Jordan Peterson met with Sean Ryan, who is a former Navy SEAL. And in this video, they get rather deep into what Jordan Peterson believes the purpose of the Christian life is and what it means to actually follow Jesus Christ. He's going to set up a distinguishing contrast between what is faith, what is works, and well, how do these two things play themselves out in terms of making a commitment to living the Christian life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's a very, very interesting conversation. I'm going to break this down bit by bit as we go. So let's get started. The thing what about you... God is that God isn't something you believe in. This is the thing. Or people, or you could say that the way we conceptualize belief in the modern world is shallow. To believe in God is to commit your life. That's what the belief is. It isn't the statement, I believe in God. You could... The statement can get in the way. It does all the time. It says in the Gospels, Christ himself says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Just because you say you believe something, it's like people say all the time that they're Christians. I'm a believing Christian. It's like, that's hard there, buddy. That's the most difficult possible commitment by definition. It's the, because it's the hoisting of the cross. Right? Really? You're going to commit to that, are you? So here's what you're committing to. Painful, painful, unjust death, accompanied by betrayal, the perfidy of the mob, and the dominion of the tyrant. And you're going to welcome that. And that's not all, because Christ harrows hell. That's not all. That's just where it starts. Full confrontation with malevolence. You're going to commit to that, are you? Because that's what, you, what you're what? doing. So Peterson kind of questions us here. He, he asks us, what is belief? And I tend to agree with him here that for the most part, within Christian circles today, the idea of belief has been really watered down significantly. It, it almost has this connotation that, well, I believe, but I'm going to go ahead and do what I want to do, and let's not worry about what the Bible necessarily says, right? Let's not worry about what God says is important to how we are to live our lives. So I'll be the determiner of what I choose to do. And well, we'll just leave the rest up to you because what's good for me is good for me. And you know, what's good for you is good for you. And we'll just leave the rest of it alone. That seems to be pretty pervasive, even amongst a lot of Christians today. What Peterson is doing is he's challenging us with the idea of commitment. What is commitment and how are or how is faith and commitment tied together? How are these two things uh, playing themselves out? So let's kind of keep watching and let's see what Peterson has to say here. Now, people will say you can't get to heaven by works alone. And that's true. That's not what I mean. That's not that's not the point here. The point is that the belief is a commitment to a pattern. The pattern is full voluntary confrontation. Full naked, crucified voluntary confrontation. Accepted in, in good faith, with joy, and courageously. Bring it on. Military people understand this. Or at least an aspect of it, right? Because they put their lives on the line. And not just their lives. They're souls. And so it's a hell of a thing to ask of people. So Jordan Peterson brings up a good point here that we cannot get to heaven by works alone. That, that faith and works actually are something that are intricately tied together. 
Now, he brings up the military and being a former military man, having served four years enlisted in the Navy and another five years as a chaplain candidate in the Army. It's a kind of an interesting way to bring this whole thing together because in the military, we are trained, I think you could even say discipled, right? Because what is discipleship? Discipleship is a form of training. It's a form of mentoring. It's a form of of inspiring, encouraging people to go beyond where they're at today to where they're going to be tomorrow. And so I think we can kind of draw this parallel here between military training and discipleship and the level of commitment that's required in the military because one of the things we learn really quickly is in warfare, we're not fighting for our country anymore. We're not fighting for uh, just survival. We're fighting for the person next to us because we've, we've come to love that person. We are committed to that person so deeply. You know, I'm often reminded that in the military, you know, you wouldn't think about this, but it's true. Tears are a really big thing. There is a lot of sadness and sorrow in the military. And what keeps a person going is their commitment to the person next to them. And so what Peterson is drawing from here is this idea of how committed are we to to Christ? How committed are we to Jesus of Nazareth? How far are we willing to go? in that journey with him. Okay, so so what does the Bible say about this tension that Peterson is asking us to wrestle with? Let's look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 for just a second. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ah, so this is a, this classic passage that, that some in the in the Protestant world, will say that, see, you're saved by faith, not by works. This is where once saved, always saved kind of comes in. I, I don't see this in this passage, and I'm going to show you why in verse 10 in just a second. See, the whole idea that, that James brings in is, is that I show you a man who says he's saved by his faith. I'll show you a man who's saved by his works. Why? Because the two are intricately tied together. You can't separate one from the other. If you truly have faith, then that faith prompts you to do something. And it's that doing something out of that faith that shows, shows us our faith. It shows God our faith. It shows the world our faith. Jesus said, no one takes a light and hides it under a bushel, right? So we're kind of back to this whole idea of shallow belief. You, you, you can have a shallow belief if your faith is real and your faith is exhibiting your behavior. But let's look at verse 10 for just a second. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So we're created for good works. We're not created for this shallow belief that says, well, now that I'm saved, I don't have to do anything. As a matter of fact, I can, I can go and I can embrace other religions if I want for a time. I can explore Islam or I can explore Buddha or I can explore just New Age contemporary ideas or, or I can just water down the gospel so that it fits my narrative or my need. That's, that, that runs completely contrary to what we just read in verse 10, that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. But what are the good works? The good works are his righteousness as outlined throughout the Bible. You know, I'm leading a Bible study right now, and we're actually talking about Torah. And in Torah, we see all of these rules and regulations about behavior. Now, these were put there because these people were barbarians, basically. They had spent 400 years in exile in Egypt, and they were left all under, under themselves. They didn't know how to live. But here we are. We're now all of these centuries later, and we know that we are created in Christ Jesus for what? for good works, because what do good works do? They exhibit our faith. And when we exhibit our faith, what do we experience? We experience the Holy Spirit and we experience God. All right, but the Apostle Paul's not done. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have already obeyed, now is in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 
For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. There we are again. We're seeing that work is a, is a primary word here, that we work for his good pleasure. Work and faith are intricately interwoven together. So let's jump back in. Let's see what Jordan Peterson says next, because I think it's going to be rather revealing. And what does, he, what does that mean? It means that there's really nothing that's more, that can provide abundance and security like the truth. So that's the lightness part of it. But the cross part of it is you have to decide not to shrink away from anything. You don't get to live in a pumpkin shell anymore. Okay, so, so Jordan Peterson now has kind of drawn out the idea of the truth and the cross, that these two things uh, are not the same, but again, they're complementary. And in that, he's kind of coming back to the idea again of commitment, and he's challenging us to think about this. It reminds me a little bit about Luke chapter 14, because in this passage, Jesus challenges us as well. Let's take a look for just a second at Luke 14, and let's see what Jesus said about counting the cost. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. So we're challenged by Jesus directly here to actually count the cost of discipleship. How far are you willing to commit to this? Because while the world is telling us, and while a lot of Christians are telling us, it's just so easy to be a Christian. All we have to do is say our prayer and we have our fire insurance to make sure we, we never go to hell. Heaven is forever. And then I can go on and live my life as I please. Jesus just completely contradicted that. He just said in every single sense of the word here that before you choose to make that commitment, you better count the cost because it's going to cost you something in this life. It isn't going to be easy. It isn't going to be fun. It isn't going to be a thrill all of the time. It's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be demanding. It might even cost you your life. Maybe it doesn't even go that far. Maybe it costs you a job. Maybe it costs you a relationship with a loved one. Whatever it is, there's going to be a cost of following Jesus. And is he more important or is the things that you're comfortable with or the things that you love more important? That's the question. All right, let's get back to Jordan. People, Christ comes back at the end of time and he doesn't reserve his wrath for the sinners. He reserves his wrath for people who sit on the fence. And, you know, people who want normal, a normal secure life. I'm, I'm not pillorying that. I'd rather have them than the radicals and the revolutionaries. But there's, that's not what a human being is. Like we're, we're bounders over the, over the stormy ocean. You know, we're built for a life of radical harness and adventure. We're built for the maximum sacrifice. That's what it means to believe, to accept that. No holds barred. Away the hell we go. And so people say they're believing Christians. It's like, really? Really? You dare say that? You have no idea what you're saying. Because it's a total commitment. It's a total commitment to ride out, to confront and ride out the worst. All right, so here we have Peterson wrestling with judgment. Wrestling with who is Christ going to judge on that day of judgment? And he's only partially right here. Yes, I think there are nominal Christians or cultural Christians who have not really understood what faith is and have not really followed Christ. And yes, Jesus said there will be many on that day who come to me and they say, look at what I did 
for you. Look at, I cast out demons. I healed the sick. I did all these amazing things in your name. And Jesus will say to them, depart from me for I never knew you. We have to understand, I've been talking about this in our Bible study, I've been talking about this in all these different videos that, that are here on, on YouTube, that the goal, the heart of God is not that we follow Him as a fire insurance policy to keep us from hell, it's that we follow Him because He wanted a relationship with us, because He loved us, because He is, he, he is not going to share our love or His love with other things. It's that simple. He's not going to... The story of the Old Testament is one of idolatry. The first of the Ten Commandments is, you shall have no other God before me. And God forgives a lot in the Old Testament, but the one thing he is resolute on is he will not share himself with false gods. And this repeatedly is what gets Israel into trouble over and over and over again. It is the core issue of Israel's struggle throughout the Old Testament and even coming into the New Testament. So to Jordan Peterson's point, let's just take a look though at Revelation chapter 3. In the first couple of chapters of the book of Revelation, Jesus introduces us to seven churches and each one of these seven churches have their challenges and they have their warnings. Well, all of them but one. The church in Philadelphia, he gives great praise to. But the other churches all come with warnings, and these warnings seem to intensify. Some theologians and scholars today believe that these churches represent eras of the, of the church age. Well, I'm not 100% sure on that, but if that's true, woo, we might be in that very last one, which isn't where we want to be. Regardless, let's take a look at one of these churches and let's see to Peterson's point what Jesus has to say about lukewarm Christians, about those who they profess to have belief, but they really don't do anything with it one way or another. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now there's a lot we could say about the church in Laodicea. Um, I've been there. It's actually really interesting terrain. There's a spring of water that runs through the area, and it's... <laughs> It's funny how God uses real physical things to make a point. It sits between Colossae and Parmukale. In Colossae, that water is cold. It's like in the 40s. And when you drink of it, it's really refreshing. In Parmukale is where the hot springs are at. The water there is rather warm. It's known for people that go there and they like to just take up the water in a nice hot bath. But in the middle is Laodicea. It's barren. It's It's got rocks all over it. And the water there is lukewarm. You All of the minerals that are in it kind of change the flavor of the water. And it is. It's, it's disgusting. It tastes horrible. And God's making a point here that if you were at least hot or cold, he could tolerate it. He would understand it. But you're neither. You're just there. You're just existing. You're doing nothing. You say you have faith, but your faith is dead. This is the warning that he gives to this church. Now, how many of that how many of us today are neither hot nor cold? How many of us aren't committed to anything? And I really think this is the heart of what Jordan Peterson is getting at here. So let's continue on and see what else he has to say. Because you have immersed yourself in it in 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 and you but you've studied it for so long. Do you believe in it? Well, I believe in it in the way that I that we just described. Do I believe that the truth sets you free? Absolutely. It isn't that I believe it even. I know it's true. I know it's true. And I try to live in that knowledge. It's very difficult to only think or say things that are true, but you can practice it. Mm -hmm. And it's a great relief. 
as you pointed out, you don't have to keep track of anything. That's just in, just that in and of itself is is it's freeing. That that's for sure. That's it's very for sure. Freeing. Do I believe that Christ is the way and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but through Him? Sure, but I also know what that means. It means that imagine that you want to have the spirit of the Almighty dwell within you, say, in this Old Testament manner. How do you do that? By taking the burden of life on yourself voluntarily. Why? Because that ca causes the best within you to make itself manifest. You know that. Look, why did you push yourself on the military front? Why did you go become a Navy SEAL? That's a ridiculous thing to do, right? They just torture you to death in the water. Why'd you do it? Because I wanted to serve my country in the highest capacity possible. Okay, so why did you think that? So you believed that there was a highest capacity, yes. right? So that was an element of faith. And, you, and so personally, you put yourself through this brutal transformative process. What, how did that change you? In a lot of ways, it changed me. It, we, we've been talking about this off and on. There was a lot of pride involved. And when I graduated from that, I never felt more pride. Another reason I did it was I always felt that I had fallen short in childhood. And I wanted my parents to have something to be proud of. Okay, and, so let's separate pride from accomplishment. Okay. Right, because you could see pride would be unwarranted pride in your accomplishment. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that there's no such thing as accomplishment. Okay, so do you feel that you accomplished something real when you went through the Navy SEAL training program? Absolutely. Okay, why was it real? Because it's the... It, why was it real? It's, yeah. It was the hardest thing that I've done. Right. That's right. Yeah, was it meaningful? Absolutely. Was it transformative? Yes. And it was the hardest thing you'd ever done. Okay, well, that's the, that's the pathway. The pathway to what's most real is through the hardest things that you can do. All right, really interesting insight from him here because this area, he's, he's pretty spot on. I mean, the truth will set you free. 100% of the time. The truth in Christ will set you free. When we embrace Jesus of Nazareth, when we accept his word as true, because as John 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and, the, and God was the word, Jesus is that word. He is the scripture. He is the I am that was with Moses at the burning bush. He has always been, he always will be, he always shall be. He, is, he was and is the God-man. He came from heaven to earth, and he lived a sinless, spotless life for over 30 years. His life, his acts themselves were redemptive for us to see how we are to live. And when he was put up on that cross as the spotless Lamb of God, not just for the forgiveness of a few sins, but the forgiveness of all sins, past, present, and future, and he died on that cross, he shed his blood for the remission of sins. He was buried three days later. He was resurrected from the dead. He overcame death. He overcame evil. He overcame Satan. He spent 40 days more discipling and sharing with his disciples. And then he ascended into the heavens at the right hand of the Father. And then 10 days later, he sent his Holy Spirit at Pentecost. We have to understand that the truth will set us free. The commitment is so much greater. The endurance, the perseverance in the light of eternity is so much greater. Think about it for just a second. Think about this. We think about looking ahead six months or a year or five years from now or 10 years from now. We say that's such a long time from now. But what we do today matters for what happens in six months from now. It matters what happens a year from now. It matters what happens five or ten years from now. In business, we know this is true. You lay out your vision, you set up your plans, you execute, knowing that today the results are going to be very different than they're going to be six months, a year, five years from now. Not that you can predict all of those results, right? But it, it gives us something to work with. 
The point I want to make is is that when we do finally make that full commitment to live by faith and not by sight, to walk in the word and in truth instead of in the world system, we're liberated. It doesn't matter what the world does to us. It, the, the Apostle Paul talked about in 2 Timothy 4 at the end of his life that he fought the good fight. He ran the race and he endured and persevered and that what awaits for him is his crown. That he will have eternal life because of his faith and what he did with his faith. That he was martyred for the gospel. I'm not saying that that's all of our calling. It's not. But what I am saying is, is that how far are you willing to commit? How far are you willing to go to really know God? Because knowing Him is not just a function of knowing the Scripture. It's having the experience of life and knowing that the endurance and the perseverance and the race set before us we encounter him. He walks with us. He encourages us. And we need the body as well. We need the church because the church is his bride. And inside the church, we, we, are, we are taught, we are instructed, we are discipled, we are brought up into the fullness of faith. We are encouraged. We are inspired. We carry one another's burdens. And when we do that, it's life-changing, it's transformative, it's the mechanism that we use and that we have that God has given us, not just in our spiritual gifts, but through one another, to overcome the adversity that the evil one will set before us. I'm going to read the last sentence that Jordan, that Jordan Peterson gives us in this video. It's, it's powerful. It couldn't be any more true. The pathway to what's most real is through the hardest things that you can do. The pathway to what's most real is through the hardest things that you will ever do. If you're going to live the Christian life, if you're going to fully commit to Jesus, it's going to cost you something. What are you willing to endure? What are you willing to persevere through? What are you willing to do to pick up, to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow him? It is a commitment. Now, here's the strange thing about this video. Jordan Peterson never tells us if he's ready for that commitment yet. He understands it. He knows it's there, but we don't still quite know, has he taken that final step? This is a really good point about discipleship. Discipleship isn't about the prayer. It isn't that you just one day arrive. You for so many people throughout history, they couldn't say that there was always a particular moment when they knew. But yet there's something in them that they're learning about this great faith of grace and love and tenderness and kindness and mercy and forgiveness. And these patterns start exhibiting in their life as the Holy Spirit gets more of them. And day by day we become more like Christ so that we are doing what the Apostle Paul warned us earlier. We are working out our salvation with fear and trembling. So ladies and gentlemen, is that where you're at? Are you willing to go that far right now? Because if you do, there's a transformation waiting to happen. That when we experience God, it changes our lives in such a way that we don't want to please the world. We don't even want to please ourselves. We want to please Him. Amen.